Hello, Internet, and welcome to the unknown battle of the Hundred Years' War. Now, everyone knows Krishi, everyone knows Ashing Core, but I find that few people have actually heard about Porsche. And since Porsche was probably as important as any of the others, I figured now would be a good time to just do a quick overview of that particular battle in uh, the 1350s, where England once again trounced the French. So yeah, enjoy. We are now in the middle part of the Edwardian phase of the Hundred Years' War. After Edward had claimed the throne of France, he had won a great naval ba battle at Sluy, thus granting him initiative in the war. And uh, some years later, of course, in 1346, he had won the great battle at Crachy, which left him and the British in control of huge swaths of the French countryside. Uh, unfortunately for all involved, uh, the Black Death then hit Europe and brought all part parts of the war to an absolute standstill while, well, the entire Western Europe, but of course France and England were ravaged by the plague and more than a third of their population was killed. However, by 1355, the British was ready for a new... Uh, offensive. While Edward himself was all fighting the Scotch in northern England, his son Edward of Woodstock, the Black Prince of Wales, were quite ready to take the war back to the French. He did this by having the British forces lead two great chevauchés into French territory, himself from Bordeaux and the Duke of Lancaster from the north, from Calais. Now, I might need to explain to you what a chevauché is. It's basically French for promenade or horse charge or something. It was a tactic used often by the English and, in fact, by many medieval armies uh, during their particular part of warfare. It's basically where you take a bunch of your men, preferably fast-moving horsemen, and then move them through a enemy territory in, as they say, a promenade, where instead of trying to conquer territory, you just pun plunder, pillage, and burn everything you get to. The whole point is sort of to discredit the enemy's government, detach their subjects from their loyalty since they could no longer gain protection and of course gain a massive amount of booty. And this was something the British, especially during the Hundred Years' War, were very, very, very good at. Edward himself managed actually to penetrate far into France and take huge amounts of plunder while destroying anything he got near. Uh, however, the eventually a massive rainstorm when he reached Tours meant that they couldn't burn the city or take it in a siege. Well, they didn't really have any siege equipment, so eventually Edward were kind of forced to turn back and head towards Bordeaux again. The Duke of Lancaster had not been nearly as lucky. He did start the thing out fairly well, but in France, the former King Philip had died in the plague, and the new king, his son John, or Sean, was uh, less willing to see his country being ravaged with himself newly installed on the throne, so he led most of his armies to the north and forced Lancaster to basically run back to Calais. Then he turned south and, with a few very powerful forced marches, overtook uh, the Black Prince around Porsche and forced him into the fight there. As was common in those days, before the battle, the two armies tried a... Um D uh, diplomatic solution. They tried to negotiate to see if battle could be avoided through the uh, agency of a local bishop of uh, the Talleyrand uh, Perigord family, who would, of course, later reach its apogee with Napoleon's uh, foreign minister. However, the British who didn't really want a battle in which they were quite heavily outnumbered, offered to give over all the booty they had taken on their chevauchée and 
give the French a seven-year truce. The French weren't happy about this. They actually insisted that since they had such a huge army and would obviously overwhelm the English, the English should surrender their entire army and the Black Prince in person to the King of France to be ransomed back to uh, Edward of England. This was not something the English could accept, so eventually negotiations broke down and both sides prepared for battle. Now, about the size of the opposing forces, almost everyone agrees that Edward the Black Prince had approximately, say, a thou six to 7,000 troops with about 2,000 longbowmen, 3,000 men-at-arms, some 1,000 Gascon infantry he had picked up before the Chevauchet, and his own bodyguard of, say, two, 300 armoured knights. Contemporary records would have the French have an army of anywhere between 35 to 60,000 men, and while that is obviously way, way, way over uh, the limit of what the French could probably field in the days after the plague, the modern-day estimate of around 11,000 seems too low to me, to be perfectly honest, simply because that everyone in that particular time considered the French to be powerfully outnumbering the English. And while 6 to 11 does seem like it's almost double, it's not actually that much of a different span in medieval warfare. And just because you had about double the men, as long as the English could place themselves on the defense, I wouldn't consider myself that overconfident that I could take him. My best guess is the French would probably have had around maybe 20,000 with about 8,000 professional men-at-arms, some other infantry, a bunch of peasant levies, and then of course the massive amount of heavily armoured uh, knights and horsemen. What is worth mentioning, however, is that the army of the English was very experienced and very very power uh, very powerful for its size it contained a lot of um uh, veterans from the battle of Crecy 10 years earlier a lot of its commanders were very good uh generals like Edward himself Sir John Chandos Captal de Buch uh, and while the army was formed into three divisions or battles at they were as they were called under Edward himself and the Earl of Warwick and the Earl of Salisbury they are every reason to believe that the last two was in fact aided by Chandos and Captal de Buch who was as I said strong and powerful generals while the French army um, led by John II was a fairly ramshackle thing just brought together in response to the English John himself was a fairly new general and while they did have a large force of professional Scottish soldiers under the Earl of Douglas in shall we say um, principle the F English army was probably the better army even if it was strongly outnumbered. Edward had deployed his forces with his uh, professional infantry in the middle on the flanks was his bowmen, and behind, hidden in a local forest, was his own armoured horsemen. The French, acting under the advice of the Earl of Douglas, the Scottish mercenary general, uh, decided that, no, advancing on horseback was probably not a good idea. They had tried that at Crecy and been beaten to pieces by the English longbowmen. Not because the English longbows could really penetrate their heavy armor, but they could totally destroy their um, horses, thus rendering the field impassable by further troops and allowing the English to uh, defend against the heavier uh, forces that the French bring to bear. This advice was further enhanced in the mind of Jean of France since uh, immediately at the start of the battle the British sent their uh, baggage train to the rear and seeing this and believing that the British were in retreat, a, shall we say, forlorn hope of about 300 German knights in French service made a forward charge against the British positions and was absolutely slaughtered. So... 
at that point, the French realized, yep, this was going to be Cresci all over again if we started making direct charges on horseback. Instead, the knights dismounted and all of the French battles advanced towards the British defensive position beside, uh, behind a row of hedgerows. The rest of the French army then began its advance on the English on foot. Now, while attacking on foot was undoubtedly a good idea, the problem was, of course, that the main battles were still led by the noblemen in their heavier armor. And that means that when they finally reached the English lines, they had basically crossed the entire battle in fairly heavy plate armor that was decided to deliver a thunderbolt strike on horseback rather than as a long-term battle uh, prospect on foot. So that means that even when the first bat a French battle led by the Dauphin, the French crown prince, reached the English line, they were tired and if not dispirited, then at least exhausted. And the English then rushed out from their defenses with their superior speed and freshness. They were able to get into the rear of the first uh, French battle and envelop it and thus uh, defeat that particular battle and send it reeling back to the main French force with heavy losses while the English were able to then retake their defensive position and be ready for the second and particularly the third uh, battle that was arrived under the king himself, the King Jean of France. On its way back to the French line, the Dauphin's division then sort of hit and blundered into the second division under the Duke of Orléans, and in the confusion, that particular division to a certain degree broke and fled with the Dauphin's division. Uh, this didn't particularly mean that the French was done. After all, the King's division was by far the largest, and now the second, uh, first and second divisions was joining with it, creating a massive hammer blow that could be aimed directly at the English. However, it was at this time that the uh, Black Prince, fooled by the fact that he thought the French was basically surrendering the battle by the first two divisions running away, uh, that he ordered uh, de Buch with a bunch of knights to charge the French in order to, you know, harry them during the defeat. This was practically in all pre-modern battles how the great... Uh, casualties were taken by any army to catch them in their uh, retreat by uh, horsemen of whatever caliber, be they heavy or lighter forces. In and of itself would probably have been a mistake since Capital de Bush troops would have hit a reconstituted and disciplined French main battle line and probably been destroyed. However, at this point, Sir John Chandros realized what was going on, but also realized a tactical possibility, namely that the way the French line was now constituted, they didn't really have any particular flanks or reserves because they were coming forward in one large block to contest with the English. And while they would eventually defeat the English simply by weight of numbers, it also meant that if the British could mount a flank attack, they would have great opportunities to do damage to the French. Following Sir Chandros's advice, the Black Prince had horses brought up from the rear and had every single man that could be found who wasn't absolutely necessary for the frontline defense mount up on those horses still hidden behind the hedgerows and within the forest to the British rear. Now, the French were again now in one massive column marching up towards the British forces in order to deliver the hammer blow that would end the battle and send the British scurrying uh, out into the countryside where the French then could remount and then destroy the British in detail, surround them and force them to surrender. However, this then led to the situation of the first time the battles advanced. Many of them were tired, they were in heavy equipment, they were used to fighting on horseback, now they were marching as infantry. And this meant that for once the shoe was on the other foot, because as soon as the French hit 
the first ranks of the British defences. The Black Prince led his now mounted forces in a cataclysmic frontal attack against the French. And this was basically one of the few battles where this happened. Usually it was French horsemen against British well-defended infantry and archers. This time it was basically British heavy cavalry against... Uh, French infantry and the French were not used to that kind of battle not to mention that this was a period of time where heavy cavalry practically always beat the infantry unless some other situation occurred as with Krishi and Ashinkor. So, Henry, so Edward let his horsemen directly into the French front and the absolute blow from this attack sent the French reeling. At this point, the other knights under Captal de Bouche then uh, hit the French from the side and in the right flank and the French battle basically collapsed. The army disintegrated. A uh, large force uh, tried to escape back towards Porsche, uh, with, followed by de Bouche and his horsemen, but with the uh, city gates closed, they were surrounded and slaughtered down to basically the last man right outside the city. Uh, there are tales that the ground was blood red for days until a massive thunderstorm finally uh, basically cleared away the blood. Back at the main battlefield, most of the French forces retreated as much possible on the Dauphin's battle that uh, moved slowly north, defending as they went. But several clumps of more stalwart knights force, uh, fought uh, the British in smaller groups until they were either killed or forced to surrender. The King Sean himself, with his 14-year-old son Philip, fought on for quite a while until utterly surrounded by Gascon and Welch archers, he, the king, was forced to surrender himself and his son to Edward, the Prince of, Wa the Prince of Wales, the Black Prince. With the battle over, the victorious and triumphant British retreated back to their own territories in Bordeaux and sent both the king and his son to England to be held as ransom and, of course, to write a peace treaty that heavily supported the uh, English forces. While it didn't install uh, King Edward as King of France, it did basically... Uh, confirm the fact that the British controlled more than half of the French core lands and would continue to hold on to them for almost 20 years before the French were able to mount anything even remotely resemble, resembling a true uh, comeback. The French king was held in London for almost five years until he was finally released uh, against some other uh, hostages in 1361, while his son, the Dauphin Charles, who had escaped back to Paris, tried to raise the ransom to free his father. He was, of course, well, it took a while. He wasn't actually really successful, and um, he was faced with a number of challenges. Rebellions sprung up everywhere since the French central authority had been so catastrophically weakened and the english of course were not uh, were not late to mount further chevauchés and attack on the french battle of porsche was important because it led to total british superiority from around the mid 1350s until the mid 1370s when the french finally managed to wrest back some degree of initiative, though the war itself, of course, continued for about another hundred years. As a postscript and to the uh, lasting glory, in my opinion, of the French king, when he was released in 1361, it was dependent on France continuing to paying installments of the ransom that was set for him. And when he, a few years later, realized that Fr France would have to default on those ransom payments, he voluntarily went into exile back into 
British cap- captivity, especially since his son, the younger son, Philip, had managed to escape the British and he felt like his honour deserved it. This was probably not a sort of good thing for contemporary France, but I think it speaks volumes for the glory of the personal honour of King Sean, and it also allowed his older son, the Dauphin Charles, to actually reach the throne, and it was Charles who, as a very energetic and powerful king, managed to, at least for a while, turn the tide of the Hundred Years' War back to the advantage of France. The battle, of course, also totally cemented the reputation of Edward of Woodstock, the Black Prince, and basically left him as the supreme warrior prince of his time in Western Europe. He, of course, died before his father, to, and it was, in fact, Edward's young uh, son, Richard, who became Richard II of Britain and... Well, there is a lot of things to be said about Richard. I might return to him another time, but there were rebellions and eventually he was deposed by his cousin. It is worth noticing, however, if the Hundred Years' War might in fact have been brought to a speedier conclusion had uh, Edward, uh, the Black Prince, survived a bit longer and been able to take the field against the more powerful French armies of the 1370s that managed to turn the tide for a while. Well, that was the Battle of Porsche. Hopefully one day I will return and do a full This is the Hundred Years War video. Well, there we are. The Battle of Porsche. I hope you found this video interesting. It is once more one of the walkthroughs of some of the battles I truly enjoy in history, and I will probably do more. This was a very important battle, again, because it established English superiority during the Hundred Years' War and would, in fact, render the British sort of... The, gave the, give the British the power they have that would allow them to continue the war for another hundred or so years while casting France into the first of its really great sort of catastrophic uh, problem times during the Hundred Years' War. Well, until next time, I have been the Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.